This is the Awful Announcing Podcast. Here's your host, Brandon Contes. Surprise, it is not Brandon Contes today. Jessica Kleinschmidt here hosting, filling in for Brandon on the Awful Announcing Podcast. Very excited for my guest because he is the one and only ESPN's Buster only. Buster joins me. Buster, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. Not Brandon, Jessica today. So I appreciate your time. Jessica, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We have nothing to talk about today. So hopefully we can kind of get through it very, very quickly. But before (laughs) we get into all of the things, it was interesting to have you on today because, you know, growing up, I watched you on SportsCenter on ESPN. And I took a step back and thought, from the moment I would watch you to now sharing the same world as you, baseball coverage has certainly changed quite a bit from when you started, when yeah. you think about the changes over the years and covering major league baseball, what comes to mind? Oh my God. Well, the immediacy of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I remember when Twitter started and, you know, I grew up uh, on a farm in Vermont and we didn't have a television and I had one sports report every day that I had access to it was on WDV at 715 and followed the farm report. And the question was whether or not my school bus would arrive before it got there. Right. <laughs> uh, and then we got the papers on Sunday, but that was it. And now I remember in Twitter started thinking, uh, you know, if you were a fan uh, of a team to get that information so fast, uh, you know, through social media, uh, you know, in the race to, you know, if you if you tweet out that somebody signed and you get it by four seconds and you're, you know, you're Woodward and Bernstein of the day. Uh, it, it is so different than it used to be just because of how quickly it moves, you know, get, and, and you don't really have when I worked in newspapers, you basically had 24 hours to process the information, to double check it, to talk to people. And now it comes out in little bits and pieces. And, uh, you know, that's the downside is I think, you know, now fans, uh, you know, see the sausage being made in a way that they didn't, you know, when they read one story in the newspaper in the morning. And and I've heard that a lot too over the years. And it's, and it's interesting, but just about like, when it comes to covering the game itself, like you want to talk about sources, but even working with some of the players over the years, that's been an adjustment too, because you can easily call them now. That's not always the case. You have to go physically see them in certain aspects. How have your relationships over the years changed when it comes to covering the game? You're right. Uh, you know, through text, through phone calls, that's the best way in a lot of cases to get in touch with players. Cause I, it really strikes me now to walk into a clubhouse and to look around this room with 26 players and 95% of them are staring at their phone, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and so in some ways you feel like when you walk up to the player and they're looking at their phone, or am I invading their time? Am yeah. I, uh, you know, is this the right timing to, uh, to talk to the player when he walks into the clubhouse? Whereas when I first started, I mean, you had three and a half hours, Tony going to be standing there just uh, hanging out in front of his locker and you could talk to him for, you know, 20 minutes. You could talk to him for 40 minutes. And now, again, it's got to go fast, got to go fast, got to go fast. And you could feel that at times body language from the players. There are exceptions. Uh, you know, you and I talked about Joey Votto before, uh, you know, getting conversation with him, Rich Hill. But a lot of the young players, you can feel that once you get past two or three questions, three minutes, mm-hmm. they're like ready to move on to yeah. you know, the next thing. And, and you mentioned three and a half hours. Does that mean the clubhouse was open for three and a half hours? The clubhouse was open from three and a half hours before the game, and it would close 45 minutes before the game. Now, they wouldn't let you in you know, during batting practice, right. and there'd be no reason to be in there because everyone's out on the field. But it basically was two and a half hours of free access going in and out. And, and look, I, I, you know, I, I'd go into the clubhouse sometimes before that time and no one would say anything. Yeah. You know, if you were an early person, it was like, well, that's fine. You know, they're in there doing work. They're being you know, a buster's working on something. No one cared as much. Mm. And, uh, you know, and certainly in recent years, we've seen the Player Association especially work to curtail the time that uh, media is in the clubhouse. And and you say like nobody would care as much. Why why did they care now all of a sudden? Was it because too many things were getting leaked? I, I just think um, that you know over time, you know what players can't stand is, uh, and more and more, and they pay attention to it is if you see a group of reporters in, in a clubhouse and they're huddled together, mm. and, and that uh, and you know especially working in New York, if you. 
or any clubhouse, you know, more and more players will go to the back rooms now than they used to. They'll go to the, the you know, the dining room. They'll basically hide for a lot of the time there's media access. And so writers now <laughs> will gather in clubhouses and you'll see them bunch together and they'll be talking to each other because they're not players that, uh, you know, that they can talk to. If you go to the Yankees clubhouse and you want to talk to Aaron Judge, you essentially have to stake him out. Yeah. 20 minutes, 25 minutes. You're hoping he comes out on the field. Well, because you're doing that and you're sort of standing and, and keeping yourself free, players will think you're not doing anything. And, and so I think that what happens is you get a lot of players through the years increasingly complaining when their perception is that reporters aren't doing anything in the clubhouse, when in fact, most of the time, they're waiting for players to come out. Yeah. And I, I talk about it a lot when we have people shadow me or you know shadowing other people. It's a lot of waiting around. And I don't think oh. people understand that. Like, and I know you deal with this. We have the dream job, right, Buster? We do it all. But when it comes to it, we we wait for guys to show up to interviews. We we'll wait for them to be available in front of their lockers, what have you. So sometimes you waste a full hour just waiting for a guy to show up. So that's the reality of it all. Yes, there's no doubt. Yeah. You know, I always make the joke at the beginning of spring training, you know, you go into a clubhouse, uh, you know, and most of them are built on concrete. And you'll get sore, you know, in the early days of spring training, it's like a pitcher getting in shape with a pitch count. You have to develop your loitering legs. Yes. You know, uh, and, and, you know, physically prepare for the, for the process of waiting for players. And then you get into the whole question of how quickly you can cut off a comp. Like if I'm waiting for Aaron Judge and I see, uh, you know, DJ LeMahieu come out, he's someone who doesn't necessarily like to talk at length. Mm -hmm. And so I might walk up to him with a quick question or two, because I know that if I were to just say, okay, thanks, DJ, I've got to walk away when you see Judge come in. On the other hand, there are other players, you know this, you get into a conversation and if you go, uh, there's Aaron Judge, I, I got to go, they get kind of offended. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so you have to stay, keep yourself fluid, uh, you know, so you get the one player that you've been waiting for. And you do spend a lot of time staking out. So I, I kind of understand the player's perception that, well, you know, Buster's standing there by the empty locker. What is he doing? Uh, well, actually, I'm just waiting to talk to players. And when it comes to staking out, do you have a story where you're like, I'm not, that was kind of intense where you've had to kind of, you were kind of, I don't want to say intense, but coming at it, looking for a guy rather quickly. Cause I know spring training is a different approach to some of these guys and what have you. Is there a story where you, you're kind of like, well, that was kind of intense trying to find a guy. Well, the biggest one, I always remember I, when I was covering the Yankees, uh, Chuck Knobloch, their second baseman, was going through a, a, the yips and a, a, you know, a situation where he, he, he didn't know if he was going to throw the ball to the stands or he's going to make accurate throws. And it was really heartbreaking to watch. You know, this mm -hmm. guy came to the Yankees, a gold glove player, and he was just melting down day by day. And you wished that Chuck would just come out and say, you know, guys, I'm not talking today. Or you know what, I'm going to give you five minutes and I'm going to go. And it was just a total wild card as to whether or not he was going to talk on a given day. And this was such a big issue on the team at that time. So you spent your time, so much time standing by his locker. And you felt there was a part of you that felt kind of bad about it because you yeah. felt like you're someone who was watching an accident on the highway. Right. And, and you know, this guy and, and I always wish that that was cleaner than it was. And I remember one night, you know, day after day after day, Chuck, do you have time? No. Chuck, do you have time? No. And then one game in Chicago, he threw three balls away and in the first five innings, was came out of the game. And after the game, I waited and waited and waited. And he came out and just poured his heart out uh, and talked about how, you know, you uh, if, if it didn't turn around, he was going to have to take it to the house was the phrase he used. Like he was just broken by this. And uh, but that's the, the result of all that time, the payoff of waiting and waiting and waiting for him to actually talk. And how does that feel? Because like, when you're around a team for a while, you kind of know the ones who will be the Joey Votto's and talk for a while comparatively to maybe the younger guys. There's some veterans who just know how to work the game. They're going to make it as short and sweet and possible as possible because they know how a lot of times you can tweet something out. It gets twisted, what have you. What's it like to kind of watch a guy, I don't want to say blossom, but have a, a certain interaction with the media after perhaps that wasn't the case over, over the season? Yeah, and a lot of them don't know sort of the expectation. Uh, of what they're going to do. And my favorite example of that is, uh, you know, Buster Posey 
uh, you know, in his rookie year with the Giants or first year he's in the World Series in 2010 with the Giants, all the reporters were complaining to each other that what a jerk. He only stayed for like two minutes in front of his locker. And I can't remember the circumstance, but you know how catchers are. Yeah. They're viewed as the, the, the go to person, especially after a great pitching performance. And that whole World Series, I was hearing, God, Buster's a jerk. What a jerk. What a jerk. Uh, and, and I mentioned it to his representative when the World Series is over, like, boy, you know, I'm just going to give you some feedback. People thought that Buster, who I hadn't spoken to at that right. point, uh, you know, they thought he was a jerk. Uh, and he said, hey, would you mind talking to him about it? And so within five minutes, I get a phone call and it's Posey. And he wow. was like, what were you hearing? And and he goes, huh? He goes, well, what was what was their expectation? And I walked through how. Look, if you're a catcher in the postseason and you've been there, there's wave after wave after wave of reporter mm -hmm. and they don't share the quotes each. He might get asked the same question six times because they wave cycle through. And I told him that and he was like, no one told me that. Mm. <laughs> he had no idea that that was a culture. And I, I gave him the example of Benji Molina, you know, who when he was with the Giants, he would go in and get a bottle of water. He put a towel over his shoulder and he knew that he was going to have to deal with that. And I think for yeah. a lot of the players, just a learning process. And he was great after that. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you mentioned him. I When I had my sit down with him, you could tell he was very he took a few pauses to answer some of the questions. And I have a tendency to kind of come in hot because same thing. I think I have like a three minute window and he's going to just disappear. Right. And he was so he was great about that, too. He is low key, very funny. I think that he oh, doesn't want to totally. be totally. dry sense of humor. Yeah, totally. I don't think he wants to be bothered, though. So I don't think he shows off his humor as much. But I, I talked to Alex Wood about this recently. If Buster Posey's in your clubhouse, the entire clubhouse is different. His presence alone yes. just shifts everything. The fact that he called you is such a veteran move and such a leader. And he move. was a second year player who was yeah. learning about everything. Yeah. That's amazing. It, it, his the second year he did that? Yeah, it was after wow. his first World Series appearance in 2010. And as I wow. said, there was heard all this complaining. And I, you know, my sense of him from talking to Bruce Bochy's manager was, yeah, Buster's a great guy. And other yeah. teammates were like, Buster's a great guy. And that was complete opposite from the feedback I was getting from the producers who's walk, who were walking with cameras and Posey in their eyes. He blew us off. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just that he he wasn't aware. And I, and I think we have to remember that, that for a lot of the players, especially in the postseason, it's the first time they go through something like that. When did you kind of notice over the years that we're finally embracing these people as people? Because I think social media is brought us closer to them. But there was a point in my life I would never imagine being able to just tweet and then have an MLB player respond to it. Do you think over the years we're finally embracing these guys as human beings? I think that the industry is, like reporters like yourself are, uh, but I think that generally speaking with social media being so reactionary, I think it's actually creating walls between the players and us. Um, because as you know, I mean, there are some players who will look at each of us individually, you know, they're yeah. going to have a different experience with you than they would for me. Uh, and they're not going to hold, uh, you know, my sins against you, mm -hmm. but there are, uh, in a lot of cases, as you know, players who will absolutely go, you guys, you guys, you know, you did this and we get right. moved in not only with other reporters, but sometimes with social media. Yeah. And I think that that, you know, has built in a reflex of, Oh boy, I don't want to get into this. Uh, you know, and maybe that's part of the reason why increasingly when you go into a clubhouse, there are fewer and fewer players being accessible. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a benefit to them having their wall back up? I understand it for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I mean, you see if a player, uh, you know, has a bad game, you see it every day, uh, NCAA tournament, somebody, you know, misses a shot there's going to be some sort of a response uh, mm -hmm. on social media. You know, what a jerk. Uh, this guy stinks. He's terrible. Um, you know, my first advice when I, I, you know, players ask me what they, what I would do or, you know, my advice to them, sometimes they'll say, look, I'd stay off social media. I mean, it really is brutal. Some of the responses that people get, I say that sometimes to young reporters, Yeah, like you can use it. I think it's a great tool, but you talk about a place for negative feedback. And, and I do think that, you know, what we do can can sometimes get grouped in with that. 
What was it like being exposed to social media for the first time as a reporter? I was excited. I mentioned before that, uh, you know, my first times on Twitter, I just thought, how cool is this if you're a fan? Yeah. You know, uh, if you get, you know, Jason Stark, uh, Peter Gammons, you know, Tim Kirkchin tweets out something immediately, uh, or you, you know, and you get the information about a player move that's going to happen. How cool is that? Yeah. That you uh, have that access. You don't have to wait for the next morning story. So that was my initial reaction. And then, of course, over time, it's become so toxic. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, like you know, I've talked to my kids and I'm like, look, it's not personal. You yeah, know, it, it's it's business, but that doesn't make it any fun, you know, know, for people to hear their names and people will spew out stuff. Um, you, you know, to me, it's just a great tool to to dispense information to fans who are interested and you can't really worry about the, the crap. Do you think positives are outweighing the negatives on social? Um. I think there's an incredibly positive benefit for fans to have access to information. And that's why, you know, I keep doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, it is much more toxic than it was yeah. when it first started. Yeah, I, I'm right there. And, and that was a personal question because I, I love and hate social media. And I think they're on yeah. the exact same shelf at the moment. Like, oh, love it. As I say, I, I mean, you have to remember, like, none of these people know you. Yes. None of them know anything about your background. So when they say things are uh, whatever the reason, it really doesn't have anything to do with you. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I'm going to make a shirt that says that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> like just because I need to be reminded sometimes. And I, even sometimes ASPR will pull me aside and say, Jessica, it's not personal. I'm like, yeah, but like it, a stranger hurt my feelings. I'm just going to be honest with you about that. And that's OK, too. Admit it that this random guy hurt your feels and that's OK. Um, well, I was going to, and I just say this, you know, I say to my kids all the time, I mean, as you know, when you meet people out and about, you know, traveling or at the ballpark airport, 99.9% .9 of the interaction is fantastic. Yeah. But I've told my kids, look, you know, and I've said, don't bother Googling my name because mm. you know that it's going to get ugly. And I said, you have to understand, it's not really about me. It's about the person who has my job yeah. working for a prominent company, whoever had would have my job would get a very similar response, whether it's positive or negative. You know, they don't, if someone comes up and they want a picture, it's not really about me. It's the person who has my job. That's interesting to think about. Yeah. Cause in, and, and that sucks just cause we are, we're individuals, right? We, we definitely, I, we're both proud of what we do, but we have to separate ourselves from that. And that's hard when you work in an industry that you have to be on 24 seven, right? Well, I would say this. It's easier for me, I think, in part because I grew up in a family where no one cares about sports. Oh, like no there one. you go. Like, in fact, among my three siblings and my stepdad, my mom passed away, you know, 17, 18 years ago. But among my family, only one of them has a television. No one watches. No one cares. When we get together, the conversation, my brother's a logger. You know, they, they live on farms. They have gardens. I mean, that's the conversation. No one asked me about the Red Sox and the move they're going to make. Right. No one asked me about anything. So <laughs> there, there's always that feeling, you know, of uh, has always been like, yeah, you, you know, what you do is not a big deal. And so that. and that makes it easier for me to sort of separate the personal from the business side of it. Good for you. That's the secret sauce. Just be born into a family who doesn't care. about. They stuff. do not care. <laughs> let me tell you. In fact, this summer, we all get together for a couple of weeks up in upstate New York. Uh, and one of my things I decided to do for all my family members, my nephews who also don't care about sports and my nieces who don't care about sports, we're going to have a, a, a baseball trivia night on the back porch. Well, that's okay. you're just going to sweat. Well, no, no, no. Up. It's me giving the test to oh, them. Okay. So we can okay. all have a laugh about how baseball is completely irrelevant in their eyes. Well, what questions are you going to ask? Are you going to make them relatively simple or? Uh, name two teams in the state of California would be a great question where I bet you I stump everybody on the porch. That's amazing. <laughs> and I'm just curious because then you, you create the curiosity about like, where do they think the Rangers play? Right. So that's kind of interesting. And they'll and, put yeah. it together. Let's yeah. see, Rangers, Texas. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's true too. And then like, that's just helping them in the long run. And and that's, I'm glad you mentioned that my, my best friend of like 22 years, she's a Yankees fan by marriage, but she, I could tell her Barry Bonds was still playing and she would believe me. And I right. love that. I love that about her because I know she's not like 
using me. <laughs> like she couldn't care less. It's a beautiful thing. It's so amazing. my daughter is in grad school in Japan. She she wants to be a Japanese professor. She loves the language and she doesn't care a whit about sports. Yeah. And yet this last two weeks, she's so excited to see the reaction in Japan wow. about Otani getting married. Oh, and and so she'll send me like if you talk about his wife, here's the proper pronunciation and the way to say her name. I heard and that I had on, her on a podcast yeah. recently, and uh, you know, okay, we have breaking news from Japan. Otani's getting married. Sydney, can you give us the update on how the news is flowing there? And you know, we we had a laugh for four minutes about it. My and it's and it's so cool to hear about that international stuff because K-pop was huge. A friend of mine, she hosts the K-pop. Yeah. Show I'm serious. And when the Giants made their move, she immediately texts me, say, if you want to have a FaceTime and I can tell you how to how to work in, in the Korean industry and all of that, the culture. And she just got so excited. It's such a beautiful thing to see. I love that. Um, I wanted to pick your brain about the off season. Uh, the I don't want to say the lack of moves because the moves certainly happened, but perhaps what like yesterday, some of these moves took place. But yep. the one in particular, I'll be Jordan Montgomery still not signed. Tell me a little bit about the off season because comparatively to off seasons past, some guys still aren't being signed. Is that a shock factor right now? Because, you know, I mentioned Jordan Montgomery wasn't signed. Blake Snell was a last minute signee. Same with Matt Chapman. What was the market value for the free agency? So during last season, uh, I was hearing from agents and I was hearing from executives like this upcoming offseason is going to be really, really slow. And I reported that mm -hmm. on Sunday Night Baseball and immediately I got a text from Scott Boris and saying, absolutely not. This mm -hmm. is not going to be this way. And he was laying it out, uh, you know, very in very even handed terms. And he said, no, this is what's going to happen. And I'm like, Scott, I'm just telling you what I'm hearing from some of your peers and from some club executives. You know, they. Their sense was not only because of, as you know, as you go through the course of a, a labor agreement in the middle of it, some of the spending starts to go down. There were the television concerns and a lot of the high end free agents, especially pitchers, had been injured. And yeah. so the feedback I'm getting was it's it's going to be a little uglier. So then we go into the winter time, And after we get past the excitement of the Otani contract, four hundred sixty one million dollars uh, in real value and Yamamoto contract then it starts to go downhill and everything those agents predicted and the executives were predicting to me turned out to be exactly true to the point that we're seeing this, uh, you know, uh, uprising within the union in the last 72 hours, the conference call uh, earlier this week on Monday night. I think that what we're seeing now is the first, and it's the first time I've ever thought it was possible uh, th that the union at some point after they go through some kind of a change in their leadership, that there will be a salary cap. Uh, because the, the owners brought it to the players, you know, the last time mm -hmm. and their feeling was, look, we'll give you more money to the to the whole of the players, uh, but we're going to have to have some ceilings and some floors. And that was rejected outright by the union out of principle. And now I wonder if the middle class is rising up and saying enough. This is bad. It's not only about, you know, the top guys and how much they get, but it's also these veteran out. Tommy Pham, as you and I speak. He's still out there looking yeah. for a job. He had a nice season last year. They're veteran players who had, you know, who could be productive, getting two, three million dollars. And you know, there's a growing number of relief pitchers. I think there are a lot of players increasingly unhappy about how the salaries are coming down. And you mentioned, you know, Tommy Pham being an example. How else would you define a middle class guy, major league baseball player? I think anybody. Uh, you know, who has a significant amount of service time, let's say four years plus, mm -hmm. there is an expectation, as you know, that they're going to get paid. Uh, but teams are more and more non-tendering players when they reach arbitration because they don't want to pay that. And the pool of free agents every year gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and the we're seeing in the wintertime, you're going to be an effective reliever and you might get non-tendered and you might get a million and a half dollars the next year. And, and I think, so while we are seeing benchmarks broken, you know, Zach Wheeler, the biggest extension ever, three years of $42 million. Those guys are the outliers. Mm -hmm. And I think we started to see the split in the, at the end of the last labor negotiation when the executive committee, which as you know, are made up um, primarily of Boris clients, voted against the offer that the owners had made and they were overwhelmingly, their 
uh, advice was overwhelmingly rejected by the rank and file. It mm -hmm. really actually reminds me a lot of what happened in the steroid era where, you know, for years and years and years, the leadership of the union said on principle, we're not going to allow testing. We're not going to allow testing. And when I would talk to players privately, rank and file, I was getting back. We need testing. I don't want to have to make that choice. Uh, and eventually in 2003, that group rose up and said, no, yeah. we're going to have testing. And in the same way, it feels like that the middle class now is stepping up and saying, no, we need more money for guys in the middle and not just the high end free agents. And I know you specifically mentioned Flaherty, who is one of the spokespeople for players. What's it like right. to have these guys actually speak up? It feels like for the first time in a while, the players do have an actual say. Yeah, and I think it was, and I'm trying to remember the player's name. Jeff Pass and my colleague wrote about this, there, that there was a player who's on the opposite spectrum. He's he's more, oh, it was Lance McCullers, actually. Oh. Uh, he did an interview, and he said that the fact that players are engaged is a good thing. Yeah. Big picture for the players, because it really did feel like 2020, 2021, you could go into a clubhouse and players didn't understand the issues in the way that they did, you know, back in the mid 90s when they were probably at their highest in terms of their overall strength. They're, uh, you know, relative to the the overall uh, strength of the union compared 1995 to now, it's so different. And so to get mm -hmm. players engaged can only be a good thing for all of them. And what was your stance on the salary cap over the years? I, you know, I, I mean, I'm just, uh, my feeling is, is that uh, I didn't think it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. because I, first off, I didn't think you could get the big market teams like the Yankees and the Dodgers mm -hmm. to ever agree to that sort of system. And the question, of course, is how do you make that work for the players? Well, if in fact, and 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 the, the players union never really gamed out to figure out if there was an overall benefit mm -hmm. for the for all the players to have a salary cap system. Um, I don't know if, if it would, but I suspect that if you take a system to players, and I'm just making up numbers out of right. thin air. Let's say the overall players pool grows by 15% uh, with a cap system. I think there'll be a lot of players in support of that. If they feel like, look, there's more money uh, available to all of us. Why would we not at least have a conversation about that? And players were upset that I spoke with who, uh, that they felt like it was just rejected out of hand, the idea when it might benefit more players and they wanted mm -hmm. it to at least be explored. And comparatively to those middle class players, to the guys who are getting these astronomical contracts, right. were the guys who were getting the astronomical contracts involved in some of these discussions? More so. And that's that's where the whole dynamic of, you know, Scott's clients uh, being the majority of the executive committee yeah. members was such a big deal to the rank and file. As you know, there's this perception that Scott has a lot of influence within the union leadership with Bruce Meyer. And it was because of the numbers on the executive committee that I think that a lot of players felt that way, that, wait a second, you know, is Scott Boris, uh, you know, slash Bruce Meyer slash head of the union going to represent the interest of all the players? Or is he going to try to maintain a system where, you know, the elite free agents can get as much money as possible? Um, and whether or not that's actually true, you know, I know, uh, you know, in Jeff's story, Andrew Miller pushed back against that. Mm -hmm. And he's not a Boris client. Uh, but. Uh, I, I know that a lot of players absolutely believe that, that the interests of the middle class have not been represented. I spoke to a former player. He would, he had just, he hasn't officially announced his retirement, but I think he's pretty much retired. And he told me this conspiracy theory about Scott Boris, but it sounds quite interesting because he's, he, he believes that Boris has a bigger, had, I'm going to say had, had a bigger impact up until recently on just the league overall. Do you think that that's true? And what kind of impact does he have just as being a super agent? Well, look, uh, to me, Scott is like uh, Theo Epstein in terms of his prominence. He's the greatest ever. And yeah. that's never going to change. You know, Theo could, could run a baseball team and they could finish last place 10 straight years, but it's never going to change the fact that he was the guy running the team mm -hmm. When the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in you know 86 years, and the Cubs won the World Series for the first time in 108 years, Scott's that person on the union side. Um, but there's also no question that this winter, in terms of perception within the industry, 
that he took some big hits. You know, Blake mm -hmm. Snell being the biggest one. Uh, last week when Blake Snell was throwing for scouts, auditioning for scouts of, uh, I guess, the Houston Astros and the Giants, I tweeted out, that's like for to ask a reigning Cy Young Award winner to throw for scouts is like asking Tom Cruise yeah. to audition for a community theater. Like, mm -hmm. what is going on? You're not going to have a better platform here than Blake Snell, and yet he winds up signing a two-year contract with a lot of money deferred. That's insane, and you can't paint that as anything other than a loss. I don't disagree with, I mean, excuse me, I don't agree with the perception that the Cody Bellinger contract was terrible for him um, and some of the others. I think a lot of times Scott suffers from the fact that we have these huge projections in the fall that are put out by reporters. Well, you know, Blake Snell is going to get 220 million or Blake Snell is going to get 230. And so when he gets 62, it makes Scott look worse. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, while he might have had some victories, Matt Chapman, Blake Snell, big losses. And I guess every now and then you get a loss, even if you're Scott Boris. So that's interesting. And he's um, played a gamut and, he, and he's done so well and you can't argue with the track record. But in those two instances, man, that, that you know, that really hurt the player. Matt Chapman turned down about $125 million last spring from the Toronto Blue Jays and he winds up getting a $50 million contract. I, I mean, there's no way to sugarcoat that. Yeah. And last uh, free agency question before we move on, the TV concerns always kind of intrigued me. There's a lot of monetary value that goes into these TV deals. How prominent were they in a slow free agency? Um, they were definitely cited time and time again by players, mm -hmm. the Rangers being the best example of that. You know, at the beginning of the offseason, with the Rangers having won a World Series with Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, two really expensive free agents leading the way, you know, after they acquired, you know, Jacob deGrom and, and Max Scherzer, we all assumed, I think, that, well, the Rangers will be aggressive spending. And so, yeah, you figured that they would bring back Jordan Montgomery that mm -hmm. maybe they would be a major player for Josh Hader, who would have fit their team perfectly. But what the Rangers are telling everybody was, you know, we don't have that money to spend. That was a message going out from them, from the Mariners, uh, the Padres pulling their, you know, uh, uh, payroll way down. Uh, I think it had a big impact. It had a huge impact on, on free agency this winter. Is it real or not? You know, <laughs> yeah. About Ray Davis, the, the Rangers owner, how much is he worth? Could he have taken a Peter Seidler approach and been willing to spend a little bit more money? Yeah, absolutely, he could. But as you know, most teams don't are run that way. They're mm -hmm. not where you don't have owners willing to pay money out of their pockets to give the team a better chance to win. I lied when I said I didn't have – that was my last free agency question. I need to no stop worries. doing that. Every time I say, like, this is the last one, it's never the last one. Um, <laughs> but this one has to do with opt-out contracts. I feel like there's an increase in them. When did you notice an increase in a lot of these opt-out contracts? Uh, well, I mean, Scott, we talked about, uh, you know, Scott's preeminence in the sport. Uh, that, that to me, he was the one who really popularized that, mm -hmm. you know, the pillow contract. It allows them to go out. I think it thought it was a way for he, him to, to get the most money uh, in an annual or average annual uh, basis. And so that that's handy for him in some situations like Cody Bellinger is a, 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 you know, a great example that it's been, what, five years since he played in more than 140 games mm -hmm. and he had really bad years. And, and then he had this terrific season last year with the Cubs. There were front offices that are like, well, we don't want to get the bad Cody Bellinger that we saw for a few years. And so for him to get this deal where he's getting paid 30 million dollars, you know, top of the market really great money for a year. And if he backs it up with another good year, he go go back in the market that worked for Carlos Correa too. Uh, you know, before he flunked his two physicals, he was going to get what $350 million mm -hmm. from the San Francisco giants. I, I, I think it's a novel concept that at the beginning of it, teams were like, wait a second. I don't know if I want to buy into that. And now teams are getting more and more comfortable with it. I was thinking that too, like at the beginning, it was more like pro toward the player and now like the front office and the owners benefit from it as well. So that's kind of interesting to look yeah. at that dynamic. Yeah. Right. It's taking, you know, and you know, the old mantra within front offices is there's no such thing as a bad one year deal. Mm. So, you know, the giants are sitting there and yeah, in theory, they're paying Blake Snell a lot of money, but they don't have a long-term obligation. And, mm. and I think that's where teams look more and more at, at that as being a benefit. Definitely. 
Um, I'm surprised it's taking me this long to bring up Shohei Otani, but I'm doing it now. Um, I asked, Eduardo Perez came on my podcast and it was an interesting question when I asked him. I asked him, when you were playing, if I were to give you a crystal ball and I said, they're going to bring over this player in, from an in international player, the Dodgers are going to pay him $700 million. If I were to tell you that during your playing days, how would you react? How would you have reacted if I told you that exact scenario maybe 15 years ago? I would have said no chance, mm. absolutely no chance because you're accustomed to, and I think this is on the increase with front offices, you know, using analytics, they are control freaks. They want to control everything, which is why I think you're seeing more relievers used because they want to control what the, you know they feel is going to happen out to out. You're seeing fewer knuckleballers because, as you know, like knuckleballers on a given day, you don't know what they're going to bring to the table. So front offices are all about control now. And what was unique in Otani's case was he was established as a two way player. He had mm -hmm. the leverage, you know, uh, to tell any team that were to, to sign him. The first thing that signed him over here look, this is what I want to do. And if you don't share my vision, forget it. And as you know, when Otani first came over here, the perception of a lot of evaluators was he's not a great hitter. Like he's not going to be a great hitter. I think a lot of teams, if Otani had been an amateur coming out of you know college here, they would have said, got to choose. You got to mm -hmm. pick one or the other, but we're mm -hmm. not going to let you uh, control the situation. And let's face it, Otani controls so much, uh, not only media access, what he does, uh, you know, day to day, so, you know, he doesn't speak to sponsors and he also has an impact on the rotation and, you know, he needs a six man rotation, which affects everybody else. A lot of front offices these days would not have done that. And by the way, I'll push back with you on this. Whenever anybody says $700 million contract, it drives me crazy. Because uh, it's not the actual amount. It's not real. Yeah. And yet, you know, we in the media have completely bought into it when, and we know it's not real. It was essentially these artificial numbers were created for his agent to be able to say I was the first person to do 500 million, first person to do 600 million, first person to do 700 million. The contract that Yamamoto signed for $325 million, because it's paid present day and not $680 million deferred, is actually worth almost as much as Otani's contract. Wow. Because he can actually make money with that as opposed to so much of the money the Dodgers are paying is deferred. They're going to make more money on Otani's dollars than he is. Wow. That's interesting to think about. So his, so the actual value of it, by the way, and by the way, it's a great contract. It's the biggest in the history of baseball in terms of present day value. But the real number is $461 million. Huh. Huh. It's interesting to think about. Well, um, I, you know, we, we've had a joke on the podcast. Paul Mbikides is a researcher at ESPN. Uh, and after, you know, the media continually parrots this about the $700 million deal, I, you know, I brought Hembo in and I said, hey, uh, we're going to make you a, an offer of a $701 million, mm -hmm. $10 up front, uh, and it's deferred for 126 years. And it's, yeah. that's the value. He'll get to $701 million when it pays off in 125 years. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, no, that, that's interesting. Um, and on that note, <laughs> the latest with Otani um, is the firing of his interpreter, more yeah. importantly, his best friend, Ipe. And ESPN's Tisha Thompson did such a great job on this investigative reporting. And it was essentially a massive, a victim of mass of a massive theft. That's what ultimately came came down to the story. And from of, his lawyers. From, from his, his lawyers, lawyers yeah, that, and, that, that and that's word, massive theft. Those words, and that's then that's what's interesting, and because the story changed, and that's yeah. kind of the big thing there. What's the latest on this four point five million dollar theft of gambling debt, and um, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, the next question is what uh, you know where uh, where do the feds who are looking into this take this? And mm -hmm. will they investigate? And then we also have the question, and there are indications that Major League Baseball is going to investigate. They have to. They don't have a choice, in my opinion, yes. where because they can't just look the other way. You've got the most prominent player in your sport uh, who is connected with this, whether it was, uh, you know, through the interpreter uh, using his account uh, to, you know, pay off gambling debts or uh, we don't we don't know all the facts of that. And it, Major League Baseball needs to do that. Every time Major League Baseball has gotten in trouble in its history, it's because they look the other way. They bury their heads in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what happened with steroids. 
where for years and years and years, he talked to executives and players. They knew the problem was happening. And it was like, everyone was like, blah, blah, blah. They didn't want to have to deal with it. Right. The sign stealing stuff. Same thing. I remember in, in uh, September of 2017, when the Red Sox and Yankees were, uh, you know, whacked or slapped on the wrist by, by Rob uh, about the, the sign stealing stuff. And he basically just gave the minor fines. It was like, you are opening up Pandora's box as opposed mm -hmm. to coming out and dealing with this. And given the history of gambling in the sport, where you have the 1919 Black Sox, then you have everything with Pete Rose, they're obligated to look into it um, and, and find out what happened. And I don't know what happened, but Major League Baseball has the power to go and find out what happened and deal with it. And and I think that the, uh, the other big question is, how did these transfers occur? Right. Or, or what went behind? Because Ot Otani's name is on them. Yep. And you kind of mentioned it, though. Well, actually, let me let me let me take a step back. You and I both know when it comes to being a team interpreter, or specifically a player's interpreter, it's more than just dealing with the media. And I've seen it. And actually, I've specifically seen an interpreter have to interpret when it comes to billing and finances and travel. So it's more than just they're interpreting for a, pro, a post game interview, or in this case, Otani signs a, a massive deal. So there is more of a personal relationship that goes involved when it comes to being somebody's interpreter. Yeah, no question. You know, and I, you know, in most cases, as you know, they become very close friends. You know, I remember when Hideki Rabu was pitching with the Yankees, George Rose was his interpreter and they were, they were close friends to the end of Hideki's life. Uh, mm -hmm. And the perception of Ipe uh, and, and Otani is those two were really close. They spent so much time together. I think, uh, you know, I read where Ipe, you know, at one point said that he spent more time with Otani than he did with his own wife. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why we're asking these questions. And we know that the the story that was put out, uh, that was told to Tisha uh, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, that story changed. And we don't know why that changed or how that changed. We know this too. Shohei Otani is an incredibly valuable asset for Major League Baseball for the Dodgers, for CAA, who represents him. Uh, just as when I covered the Orioles, uh, Cal Ripken was not only a great shortstop for them, but he all, was also financially so important to that franchise. Yeah. They were going to do what they needed to do to, to protect him. Same thing when I covered the Yankees, Derek Jeter. They were going to do what they could to protect him. Uh, and, and so uh, that's why Major League Baseball needs to dig into this and to get answers about what exactly happened. How would this investigation go about if it, this weren't Otani involved in it? Oh, I I think we've already would have heard that they were looking into it. Mm -hmm. But I think Otani is such a prominent player that, you know, there's this feeling of <laughs> I, I, in their perfect world, I'm sure they would love for this to go away. But yeah. I think it's so complicated. And again, because of baseball's history with gambling, they need to look into it. Uh, yeah. You can't on one hand have uh you know, the crackdown and on every clubhouse uh, wall, there's a sign that says, you know, you're not allowed to bet on baseball. Um, yeah. It's such an important rule in the sport. I don't think they'll have a choice but to look into it and to answer questions, uh, you know, for themselves about what exactly happened. And, and you mentioned it and Tisha brought this up on the on the Baseball Tonight podcast, too. It's somewhat of uncharted territory, but so at one point was steroids and so at one point was the right. sign stealing. So why? But I feel like we in NFL, a lot of guys are getting in trouble for betting. So I don't understand why this is taking its time. They and, and Tisha made a point. It looked like that what, there was no betting on baseball. But why is it still up in arms where they could easily make an excuse like, oh, this is new. We're still trying to figure it out. But it's really not that new. No. And and I and look, I have not called Major League Baseball today as you and I speak to find out exactly where they stand on this. But you would have hoped that at the beginning of when baseball began to, in all sports, began to embrace, embrace betting in a different way, that they also prepared. At, yeah. And we also have to be aware of the potential fallout because it's inevitable that it's going to happen yeah. when it's so ubiquitous within the sport and everything is around it. You're going to have players who don't have awareness, don't have an aware, you know, don't, uh, don't know the history are are not going to be careful and just do silly things. You know, and make yeah. silly decisions. I, I we as uh, you know, you see throughout the history of all sports. 
Yeah. And, and one would think like the legalities are certainly different, but unexplored. And it's, it's, it's so, it's such an interesting thing. And it's, this particular situation, we have more questions than answers, which we is do in part because of the answers that we that Tisha got, yeah, and how they're contradicting, and how does that story change? And you know, uh, you know, to, to, to go back to uh, to you know, the lines from Watergate, what did uh, Otani know, and when did he know it? Yeah, um, and and covering a lot of interesting stories over the years, shock factor wise, where does this rank? Oh, it's it. I actually had this conversation with Tisha before we started taping yesterday, uh, and and I put it up right there with the Nancy Kerrigan. Uh, wow, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, that where you're like, oh my god, what? Yeah, <laughs> I, like, I thought I was being. I, I thought it was. Yeah, if I wasn't, if I didn't have my notifications on for certain beat reporters or certain insiders, yeah, I would have thought it was. Like, cause that, it, it just seems bizarre. To, it was bizarre. I, I, yeah. So even for me, it, it was so bizarre that like, I didn't feel like I could text my, my group chat full of baseball people because I thought it was a joke. Like there was, it just seemed too weird for me, but. Yeah. Tisha, Tisha agree with me. I was like, boy, when you have two Olympic competitors and one is on the side and, you know, Tanya Harding is on the side of an, an attack with a baton on the knee of the number one competitor at that time. That was that crazy story. And you're like, what? No way. And this but feels now, like. Now that we know the Tanya Harding stuff, it doesn't seem that far fetched. I feel now. Right. <laughs> right. Like now, now it's like, OK, that kind of. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Yep. Um, before I let you go, um, I'm a, obviously a very big Votto fan, All and right. and I really appreciated when you had Dan Schulman on, where it wasn't just a beautiful, cute Cinderella story of Joey Votto returning home to be with the Blue Jays, um, and he's happy to take a minor league deal, but it the the Jays are giving him a serious look, so that's refreshing to hear. It really is. Uh, and I'm really happy for him. You know, I've gotten to know him through the years. He's so dang smart. I've told him over and over, you need to be the person who writes the next Ted Williams science of hitting book, which is iconic mm. in, in baseball because he knows hitting so much. I remember asking Jay Bruce once, his uh, longtime teammate, hey, do you pick Joey's brain because he's a left hand hitter like you are? He goes, no, can't go there. Like, you know, he's doing math equations yeah. that nobody else can do. But Joey's so smart. And so, you know, I w was in contact with him for a couple of stories during the offseason. And what he was telling me was, I feel great. I'm yeah. healthy for the first time in two years. My shoulder was surgically repaired. I was a mess for a couple of years. His mm. performance showed that. And so he's doing workouts and he's telling me, you know, I, I, you could feel the confidence in him. And yet no one would give him a chance because of those numbers that he generated for the Reds the last two years. And he's saying, I'm ready to go. And I think among all players, he would be someone who'd be great at self scouting. Like if he oh, would, yeah. if he stunk, he would tell you, "I stink." And he wasn't saying that. He was like, "I feel great. Mm. I will play for nothing. I want to go to, you know, if you want me to go to the minor leagues, ride buses to prove I can do this. I feel great." And that great competitive arrogance that all excellent players have to have, you just felt that. And so for him to get this opportunity in his hometown. I think it's going to be a great story. I think they're going to be moments that we're going to remember this year with him. And I'm really happy for him. Me too. Um, I had a good conversation with him about Barry Bonds and he would just watch, he would watch Barry Bonds footage to nauseam and really appreciated what Barry did and his approach. So, but what was it like to hear that the Reds weren't going to bring him back? I, you know, you understand it. You know, it was uh, Sparky Anderson, the hall of fame manager, uh, who said the hardest thing to deal with as a manager is an aging star mm. uh, because there's all the questions of, you know, are they going to play? Or are they not going to play? And I know the Reds feeling was if we bring him back, then there's going to be that push to have him in the lineup. And we think this is what they thought, you know, at the time that they had better options, mm. uh, but they love him. You know, I just to double check it, I asked around with Reds people. I said, look, I've known jo Joey for years. I have my own experience as a reporter. Tell me about your experience. And the great stories that they told me off the record about the way Joey treated fans behind the scenes that he doesn't want anybody to know. Yeah. Um, they were so moving and they had the same perception of Joey that you do, that I do, that this is a really good person. Uh, and 
So I, I can tell you this, the, the Reds decision not to bring him back, it was it was not personal, it was business. Yeah. And and that's what's interesting too, because I, I get too caught up in who they are as, as a person. Like obviously you have to pay attention to the numbers, but I pay attention to what you get off the baseball reference page. And I think of the Stephen votes of the world. And yes. obviously, obviously we're not going to look at like his baseball reference page and see all these all-star selections and, and everything like that. But those guys still get jobs. And for Joey, I just like any job he wants outside of playing essentially in certain aspects is his, right? That's what I think because he's yeah. so smart and he's so good in dealing with people. And I think he's gotten more comfortable over time too. I remember yeah. the first time I interviewed him, I mentioned how players, uh, when you get into conversations with them, sometimes they're like easy to talk to, you know, mm -hmm. Rich Hill, easy to talk to. And other players, you get the feeling they're kind of looking at their watch and they're aware that other players are watching him as they're speaking to reporters early in Joey's career. I always thought like, you know what? He's got about six minutes each time. Mm -hmm. And then he begins to separate. But now he, he he's so comfortable. You know, I love the poll that just came out about who's the friendliest person to talk to in the sport. And Joey's on that top 10 list. Yeah. And not surprisingly, Freddie Freeman's on that list. Miguel Cabrera, I'm sure at some point would have been on that list. Um, and because of Joey's open mindedness to information. Yeah. Uh, I think that's also going to serve him well, because, as you know, with front offices now, they don't want, you know, sort of the old school thinking. They want people who are willing to uh, acknowledge the things that they don't know and to learn. Votto doesn't gatekeep. And that's the one thing I love about him. He's very much like he'll let you know what you need to work on. And, oh, that, totally. you know, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. He gave me a question when I did a long profile on him and I spent time with him. I, he gave me a question. I'm not going to say what it is because it'll come off as a rip of another player. <laughs> he said, who do you would you rather take this guy or this guy? And I knew that it was a loaded question. You could feel that. And it was a little bit of a barometer for what my knowledge was going to be. And I I told him what, and, and he kind of nodded his head. And I was like, ooh, I passed that test. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, that, that would terrify me. How effective they were. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Buster, you've been amazing. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks so much, Jessica. Thanks for listening to the Awful Announcing Podcast. For the latest news spanning the sports media landscape and more, check out awfulannouncing.com and follow us at Awful Announcing.